Number 21. The energy released from condensation in thunderstorms can be very large. Calculate the energy released into the atmosphere for a small storm of radius 1 kilometer, assuming that 1 centimeter of rain is precipitated uniformly over this area. All right. So let's take a look at the picture over here. This little light circular uh, object here is going to represent the clouds. And the radius of the storm is going to be one kilometer. And what's eventually going to happen, right, as uh, over time, the water inside of the cloud begins to condense. Right? Or I should say the water vapor inside of that cloud begins to condense. And as that vapor begins to condense, it turns into liquid water, right? You go from gaseous water to liquid water when you condense. And what happens is then once it turns into liquid water, it becomes too heavy, right? And it starts to then fall and precipitate on downwards, right? Raindrops keep falling on my head. Should have been on Broadway. So uh, basically now what we realize is that after this you know, storm is precipitating for a certain period of time, the amount of water on the ground uh, will accumulate and it'll reach about one centimeter in height. I know it doesn't say that in the problem. It doesn't say one centimeter in height, but I mean, but what one centimeter is a length, right? So it can't, you know, what what are they? What length does that represent? Well, it represents the length of the depth, okay, uh, of the cylindrical volume here that would be created, okay, from the uh, storm. So hopefully that makes sense, right? The rain we're going to assume no wind, so the rain doesn't trail off onto the sides or whatever. It just falls straight down. And it's going to then accumulate, and it's going to reach about one centimeter in depth. So the question now is, or the insight is that this object right here represents the volume of water that has condensed, right? Whatever volume of water is on the ground, liquid water is on the ground, had to have come from the clouds, okay? And the clouds originated as water vapor, and they eventually turned it into liquid water. So hopefully that makes sense. So now i got to find the volume of this cylinder down here at the bottom. So what do we have? Volume is equal to pi r squared h for a cylinder, right? So let's now plug in the values. And we notice already, oh, kilometers and centimeters. Oh, that's just dandy, right? That means we got to do a bunch of conversions. I love that. Don't you? All right, so we got pi, then multiplied by r squared. Now, this is one kilometer. You know that there's a thousand meters in one kilometer, right? So I'm just going to plug in a thousand. That'll be squared. Then multiplied by the height. Now, we got to convert centimeters into... Uh, meters, right, so that we have a consistent unit across the board here. So it's basically 1 over 100, right, to convert that into uh, meters. So now I can just do my calculation, right? So why don't we just grab the calculator, and then we'll do pi multiplied then by 1,000 squared, multiplied then by 1 over 100. And what do we get? So we get a value of approximately here, 3... Uh, what are we going to do? Yeah, fine. Yeah, right to the fourth. Fourth, sorry. 3.14 or so times 10 raised to the fourth. Okay. And that's in cubic meters. Could have probably figured that out because it's just a whole bunch of, uh, you know, multiplying by 1,000, dividing by 100. But I like the calculator, don't you? All right. So now we have the volume. Okay. So the question is, again, uh, we have to calculate the energy release. So somehow we got to relate the volume to then energy released in the phase change, in the condensation. Now, as soon as you start hearing the term condensation and phase change I, and heat transfer, you got to be thinking of that formula at the top. That is the formula for heat transfer during a phase change. And specifically, since we're talking about condensation here, I'm going to say the heat uh, exchange in condensation. By the way, it's heat lost, okay? Um, will then equal, uh, excuse me, it's actually, uh, yeah, no, no, it's, yeah, yeah, it is, uh, <laughs> it's heat lost. Okay, so it's going to be equal to the mass then that has been condensed, multiplied then by the latent heat of vaporization. Now remember, the latent heat of vaporization works both ways. It works from going from a liquid to a gas and a gas to a liquid. All right, you're going to use the same value. So here we realize now, I need to know, in order to find this, I got to know the mass, right? The latent heat of vaporization is a constant. You're supposed to look that up or memorize it. So, but we don't know the mass. But we know the volume of the water. And we don't know the mass of the water. What relates the two? Density, right? 
density does. So I wrote that down over here on the right hand side, the density of liquid water. Now if you know the density, right, remember that it's equal to the mass divided by the volume. And if I solve this for mass, it's just a simple cross multiplication that is density multiplied by volume. Notice how I can now take this and substitute it on in for my mass. And now I basically have everything I need because let's take a step back and write it down and let's see. We have the density of water, that's a constant, you're supposed to look that up or memorize it, multiplied by the volume of the water, well we just found that before. And then multiplied now by the latent heat of vaporization, which that is another constant, you're supposed to look that up or memorize it. Of water, by the way, right, it's specific for water. So density, let's plug everything in, 1000 multiplied by the volume. That's in cubic meters, so we do not have a problem with that. The units are consistent, so this is 3.14 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, times 10 to the fourth. And now the latent heat of vaporization. Please be careful, ladies and gentlemen, that this is in kilojoules. All right, that's how the values are usually given. Now, that's okay. You can, you can write your answer in kilojoules. There's no law <laughs> that says you cannot, right? So let's just calculate this. So we're going to multiply them all together. One second. So we're going to multiply them all together, and 2256. So we arrive at an answer here of about 7.09 times 10 to the 10th. That's kilojoules, though. So keep that in mind, okay? That's in kilojoules. Now, that is an acceptable answer. Doesn't say what units we need, so that's fine. If you wanted to convert that into joules, just multiply that by 1,000. All right, then it's be 7.09 times 10 to the 13th joules. And that is a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, if you really think about it, it's got, I don't know, it's probably similar to like a bomb going off or something. Um, you know, so it, it, it's a crazy amount of energy uh, that's being absorbed. Um, so, yeah, or being released, I should say. And the atmosphere is, if the energy is being, uh, ab you know, if the energy is being released from the condensation, well, that energy is going somewhere. It's being absorbed then. By the atmosphere all right so uh so yeah okay cool all right that's enough guys thanks for tuning in appreciate it very much please remember to help us out and subscribe hit the like button and tell your friends we appreciate it take care